this lots of gaveling. I call this meeting regularly scheduled Dunwoody City Council meeting to order at six o'clock. We're on time um, on January 10th. And with that, I will call up Judge Heidrich to administer the oath of office to council people, Catherine Laudenbacher, Rob Price, and Tom Lambert, if y'all will join, well, Tom will join from down there, and if Catherine, thank you. And Judge Heidrich will first administer the oath for city council, and then the oath for the public facilities authority. Thank you.
And uh, as we're shifting seats, I want to give council now former councilman Ari Baskin a chance yeah. to say a word or two. Uh, since I was not elected and appointed, I don't have to concede, but I actually, <laughs> I could actually give up and pass on. So I thank the mayor for giving me the opportunity to be able to serve. I thank the council for being very nice to me and 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 this wonderful um, camaraderie and feeling that we have in the city of one of, of Dunwoody. It's really uh, refreshing, um, and I gladly pass on my my seat and my duties to Catherine. <laughs> And I, I'm sure she'll do a great job. <laughs> Thank you, Artie. Councilman Hennigan. Oh. Yes, Councilman Hennigan, would you leave please rise. At this meeting, help us to make decisions which keep us faithful to our mission and reflect our values. Give us strength to hold to our purpose, wisdom to guide us, and a keen perception to lead us. And above all, keep us charitable as we deliberate. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Chief, are you gonna provide an introduction? Thank you. Mayor and Council, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce two of our newest officers. If they would come forward and stand right here beside me. <clears throat> right here would be great. The first is Officer Darian Brewer. We're excited to have him on our team. Uh, Darian was most recently employed at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, where he worked as a security officer. And prior to that, he worked as a deputy sheriff jailer for Gwinnett County Sheriff's Office and held other positions in the private security field. Uh, we're excited that he's on our team and he joined our department on November the 30th. Next to Darian is Kyle Lubenhusen. Kyle has been employed at Ride Tech as a shop technician since 2018. And prior to that, he worked in the maintenance, food service and retail industry. Uh, he's from Indiana and uh, Kyle actually has a brother with the Atlanta Police Department. So we're excited to welcome him on our team as well. Thank you. Raise your right hand, please, and then just repeat after me. On my honor, I pledge. I solemnly swear and affirm that. I solemnly swear and affirm that. I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. The Constitution of the State of Georgia. And the charter and ordinances of the city of Dunwoody, Georgia. And the charter and ordinances of the city of Dunwoody, Georgia. I am not the holder of any unaccounted for public money due to this state. I am not the accounted for public money due to this state. Or any, or any political subdivision or authority thereof. Or any political subdivision. I am not the holder. Any other state or any foreign state which I am by the laws of the state of Georgia prohibited from holding. 
by the law of the state of Georgia for his offense. I am otherwise qualified to hold the office of a peace officer. I am otherwise qualified to hold the office of a peace officer. According to the Constitution and laws of the state of Georgia. According to the Constitution and laws of the state of Georgia. I will faithfully follow the legal rules, regulations, policies, and procedures. I will faithfully follow the rules, regulations, and procedures of the Memphis Police Department in the city of Dunwoody. So I'll go back up in a second, but to Kyle and Darian, thank you so much for joining our police department. We're so grateful for your service, the service of all your fellow uh, associates behind you. And um, our community is incredibly grateful. Yesterday was National Law Enforcement Officers Day. And we are grateful for the service that you and your colleagues provide. We think we're a wonderful place. Um, the best community to serve as a law enforcement officer. And so welcome and thank you for choosing Dunwoody. Okay. All right, public comments. I have a few cards. Um, each public comment um, person or speaker gets three minutes. Uh, please state your name. I'm gonna give us one second to let the crowd clear out and for me to catch my breath. Just for a second. Thank you. One second. Okay. We're getting there. If everyone could leave the four year area that's speaking, Susan. She didn't hear me. <laughs> okay, I think that's good. All right, Joni Dwaskin. Thank you. It, Joni, if you could make sure you're speaking into the microphone and that it's on, please. I might've turned it off. Is a green button on, green light? Now it is. Yes, thank you, sorry. Okay, hello. hello. Um, I'm Joni Dwaskin. I live at 5711 Ben Creek Road. Uh, I know that this public comment session is not a two-way conversation, but I'm at a loss about how to have a two-way conversation with my city council. Your lawyer told me that the city told her to stop communicating with me, and Councilwoman Harris has told me that the city attorney told the city council not to talk to me. So where does this leave me and other residents who've suffered from the damage the city has caused to the Mill Glen Pond? 
As a quick reminder, I'm here on behalf of the homeowners that surround the pond in the Mill Glen subdivision that's been damaged by the city's failed stormwater management system. The city has made repeated attempts to repair and restore the eroded stream bank that's dumped sediment into our pond over the years, but has done nothing to repair the damage to the pond or to prevent ongoing and future damage to the pond. When I asked the city's project manager to take precautions to avoid causing additional damage when you started the last restoration project in May of 2020, it seemed as if that was gonna happen. But with every rain, we had more dirt deposited into the pond throughout the entire construction project and beyond. Every time it rains, more sediment dumps into the pond. The city's latest attempt to stop the erosion of the stream that feeds into our pond includes the installation of large rocks in the pond upstream, in the, in the upstream creek. The water is flowing so quickly through that stream that the rocks are just rolling downstream and will eventually end up in the pond on, par, on top of the big pile of sediment. The system is broken. So I have a few questions for you. Number one, why did you instruct your attorney to stop talking with us about the extent of the city's responsibility for the pond? Number two, by telling your attorney to stop communicating with us, are you saying that the only way to get the city to talk to us is for the citizens of Dunwoody to sue the city? If we do sue you, will you talk to us then? Number three, do you really believe that after repeated failed attempts to stop the massive erosion upstream from the pond, that the city has no responsibility for the fact that our pond is choked by sediment? Number four, where do you think the dirt that used to be in my neighbor's yards upstream from the pond is today? Do you think it might have landed in the pond? If yes, then how can you say that the city has zero responsibility for the damage you've done to our private property? How can you refuse to talk to us? Number five, when you hired contractors in 2010 and 2020 to repair the failed piping and eroded stream bank upstream, did you consider the fact that the stream is connected directly to the pond? Why did you decide to try to fix only part of the broken stormwater management system? Number six, why do our upstream neighbors get the benefit of the city's attempts to repair the damage your failed stormwater management system caused to their property, but the owners of the pond don't get that same benefit? Is there something about the upstream properties that's different from the downstream properties that entitles those property owners to have the city ensure their property values are not decimated by the city's faulty system? How can the pond owners receive the same level of attention and service from our public officials that you've given to our upstream neighbors? Please consider these questions and let me know how I can get them answered. If you continue to refuse to engage with us about the extent of the city's responsibility for the harm to our pond, I'd appreciate something. Thank you, Ms. Dawskins. Next is Owen Dwaskin. Hello, Council. Hello. You'll have three minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, it won't take me that long. I'm Owen Dwoski, and I'm uh, also live at 5711 Ben Creek Road, and I will just continue where Joni left off. Um, the pond owners feel ignored, mistreated, and confused about how we are supposed to engage with them. The stonewalling is not consistent with your city mission statement. I'll read it to you now to remind you of what you have committed to do as members of this elected body. The mission of the city of Dunwoody is to provide the highest quality of life to, for those who work or play in our community and to foster an environment where business can prosper. We will serve all stakeholders in a transparent manner with resourceful, efficient, progressive, and professional leadership. I will leave you with one final question for this evening. Do you believe that refusing to talk with city residents about the harm they have suffered due to the city's actions is consistent with this mission statement. Thank you for your time. Thank you. McKenna Rees. And just make sure the green light's on and you'll have three minutes. Hi, my name is McKenna Rees and I'm here to speak with you in favor of softball fields at the Austin Park. I have played softball at Dunwoody High School since eighth grade, but my softball career started long before that. I played at Sandy Springs as soon as I moved to Dunwoody in fourth grade, but I've been playing home run derby and other fun games in my front yard since I could walk pretty much. 
Our Dunwoody softball field, in case you've never seen it, has an uneven outfield. Your right field is probably this big compared to your left field, which is this big. We have no lights, and we have one father who has maintained our field for us ever since I've been at Dunwoody. And in fact, it was the first thing that I noticed when I moved to Dunwoody. I would walk to the village with my friends, and I saw the senior baseball field, which has now been replaced with the Austin, and I realized that there was no softball field there. In fact, there is not a softball field in a publicly owned park in the city of Dunwoody. Their only option for softball players include Murphy Candler Park and Sandy Springs, which can be reserved. However, those reservations on weeknights and weekends are completely full. We have no opportunity to go out and practice on a softball field by ourselves, with a trainer, or with our teammates. Outside of Murphy Candler, there are very limited options at private schools or organizations, but they have to be booked with a team, meaning I cannot go out and practice at a, a public softball field on my own. In fact, I had ankle reconstruction surgery and I had nowhere to go practice softball before my season started for junior year. When the baseball fields were added at Brook Run Park in 2017, my freshman year, I had hoped that the city of Dunwoody would provide us with an option for softball, the easiest one being a portable baseball mound on the field where the softball players would simply pick it up, move it, practice, and then put it back. The softball players were willing to put in the work to just have a functioning field that we can all practice on. However, the city of Dunwoody, in fact, denied this request and left it as only a baseball field for the senior baseball team. Either way, even if we had gotten the mound, the baseball team would have had priority over the softball team, including at Murphy Kindler Park, where there are fields for kids my age and high school players, the football team has priority over those fields as well, leaving us with no options. Overall, the softball community, including the players, the parents, the supporters, the former players, and the upcoming generation of players have been left out of the plans from City of Dunwoody. In fact, many members of our community do not view a field as any, with any importance to the future generations. Uh, many comments that were left include, do not like the idea of softball fields. It is a waste of community space. Why do we even need one ball field? What a waste of space. How would you like to be told that your hobby, that your sport, something that you could potentially have a future in is a waste of space and not even important? Please, please consider adding the softball field at the Austin Elementary Field. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Bob Dallas. Good evening, everybody. I'm Bob Dallas and first uh, council member Lawton Lockner and Price. Congratulations. Uh, you're going to be in the ride of your life, I'm sure, for the next many years. Uh, you're going to benefit from that, I'm sure. Um, I just want to thank each of you and the mayors that I've been able to serve as a planning commissioner for. Um, that's all four mayors and all the city councils since, which include Ken Wright, Mike Davis, Denny Shortle, and then, of course, Mayor Josh. Uh, it's really truly been an honor to serve as a planning commissioner during this time. And I just cannot thank the people that I had the opportunity to work with. First and foremost, the many planning commissioners who served on this dais over these many years, they worked so hard together to help guide Dunwoody's development. I also wanna thank the staff over the many years to today with Richard. Uh, we've had a great staff and really great thoughtful people giving us insight as to how development can occur here in Dunwoody. And most of all, I really wanna thank the people who came before all of us as planning commissioners. To me, that was probably the most rewarding part is listening to what people thought about how land use and zoning should occur in Dunwoody. Their heartfelt concerns about how they wanna see their future and their kids' future here in our city. And um, you know, as chair, one of the things I always focus on was making sure that nobody left these doors without having had the opportunity to not only be heard, but to be understood. And I understand sometimes our meeting lasted a little bit longer than they should, but I always felt that was much more important than you know, our getting a meeting done quickly. Um, as I mentioned at the last planning commission meeting I attended, there were two things of what I call unfinished business, which I hope not only the planning commissioners, but the city council will consider. And you've heard me talk about these before, but I wanna mention them because I think they're really important. And I hope many other people will look into this. First is inclusionary zoning. I believe it's very important that our city take the steps to start considering what inclusionary zoning should look like in the city of Dunwoody. It's a process. Every city will differ. 
but I think it's really important that we do that. Secondly, and this has to do with the perimeter area, I believe we should implement service districts and impact fees primarily focused on apartments in order to build the amenities that the perimeter market needs. I mean, we are growing perimeter like crazy. I mean, we've read recently about some great companies moving to perimeter. A lot of people, people obviously live in perimeter now. So the amenities need to be part of that growth because it's not fair to people who we call our guests, the business people, the, the, the people who stay at the hotel, the restaurants, if we don't have that full cachet of, of amenities. So the question is, how do we pay for them? I think if this is a long-term sustainable way to bring us those amenities that keep perimeter area in the premier of the market, not just for the metro Atlanta area, but for the Southeast United States. So with that, I wanna thank all of you because you've all been great to work with and to talk to about what we think that we should look like in the future. And I just um, wanna say thank you from the bottom of my heart for being given the opportunity to work with so many wonderful people. Thank you. And thank you, Bob, just a moment of privilege for your 12 plus year service on the Planning Commission. You jumped right in feet first when we were a new city and you continued to serve for a really long time and we are grateful for your service. We appreciate it. Thank you. Joe Hirsch. Hello, uh, as you all know here on council that uh, a lot of staff, residents, commissions and other people spend a lot of time writing our codes and ordinances and charter and hopefully they're not arbitrary because most items have been debated ad nauseum and uh, y'all put in a lot of thought to most of the things. So for example, if the city has written into code that perhaps the height of a residential fence should not exceed eight feet, I would hope that the city would not just say, eh, sometimes it can be 12, it doesn't matter. Or if, uh, or if the city says there's a no truck zone on this street, that, it, that that's not enforced on just Mondays and Tuesdays, that it's equally in, properly enforced. Or perhaps uh, if Dunwoody has a sexual harassment policy, one would hope that if a police officer solicited nude photos from subordinates, um, that it would not be okay and that his actions would not be ignored. Uh, I, I bring up and ask these rhetorical questions because our city's charter is very clear on when our newly elected officials should be sworn in. Article two, section 209, says the city shall meet on the first working day in January for swearing in. That was January 3rd. January 3rd, city hall was open. So a reminder of the oath that we just heard a minute ago and those of y'all already heard was, I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully and to the best of my ability support and defend the charter ordinances and the regulations of Dunwoody. So what, what happened? Mayor or perhaps our city manager, Eric Linton, were your oath where you faithfully execute to the best of my ability? Why no meeting on January 3rd? You know, why do we have these meetings? Why do you write codes and or charter if the city does not abide by them? Why waste everyone's time if certain things can just be ignored and look the other way for city or not for certain people and enforce for some and unequal? It's not proper. Today is a perfect example of why government, particularly Dunwoody, is not trusted and there's questionable faith in your actions. We started off on a wrong foot. I congratulate Rob and Catherine on your new positions, but I presume you'll do better than those who have failed you on what should have been your first days in office. And I hope, unlike those before you, our newly elected officials will hold our own city's employees accountable for their transgressions, because right now we just get excuses as the city turns a blind eye to its own failings. Everything in the city is not okay, but things can improve if our leaders are held accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> there will be another public comment session at the end of the meeting. And Councilman Lambert, do you want to introduce the next item and then Sharon can read the proclamation? Do you want to say a few words or just how, I think you could introduce it. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. 
Oh, no, that's fine. That's fine. Could invite um, Christy, and Laura. Christy and Laura up to the podium, maybe, or up just, you don't have to stay in the foyer, for lack of a better term. Um, and you want to say a few words, Tom, about how we got to where we are today. Yes, Please. thank you. Um, yeah, so this next proclamation is about a, a very important uh, topic, and it has to do with uh, human trafficking. And uh, Christy and Laura both represent the Safe House Project, which is a group uh, that works to combat. I'm going to switch masks here. I can't talk in that one. <laughs> Let's leave it off. Uh, to, to combat trafficking and also provide services uh, to help identify um, victims of this and, and provide services for victims uh, afterwards. In, uh, and they also have training, uh, and training is an important part of this. this. This has been an important thing for the city of Dunwoody um, from a prosecution and enforcement effort. Our police department and our courts have, have fought this. We've actually recently changed ordinances uh, to crack down on some potential loopholes and make it um, prosecution easier uh, for, for ending these, uh, these crimes. Uh, but an important part of that is also education and, and learning to recognize the signs of, of who are who are the victims of these crimes, and so that we can provide services and help to those that are the victims, and hopefully prevent people from becoming victims in the first place. So uh, today, we're I'm very proud of the city for taking this step um, and issuing this proclamation. Uh, we'll be just the second city in the in the country to earn the title of a city of freedom from the Safe House Project. And with that, I'll I'll, I'll have the proclamation read. Thank you. Okay, Sharon, we're having some technical struggles today. So let's see, uh, are you ready? I am ready, Mayor. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Proclamation, City of Freedom. One second, Sharon. I'm going to step down. Okay, proclamation, City of Freedom. Whereas human trafficking is a form of modern day slavery where more than half of the active cases in the United States are sex trafficking cases involving children. And whereas hundreds of thousands of American children are the victims of trafficking every year in the United States and survivor identification is only at 1%. And whereas child sex trafficking can have psychological emotional and physical effects that can have lifelong consequences for victims of trafficking. And whereas even through, even though awareness of this crime is growing, human trafficking continues to go unreported due to its isolating nature, the misunderstanding of its definition and the lack of awareness about its indicators. And whereas providing individuals with training on how to spot, report and prevent trafficking will equip, equip people with the education they need to report suspected trafficking or prevent vulnerable individuals from being trafficked in our community. And whereas increased community education on how to identify victims of human trafficking, along with increased knowledge of local resources and services for those affected by these criminal actions can help restore freedom and dignity to identified survivors, as well as help dim diminish the number of future victims. And whereas Safe House Project educates to increase victim identification through online services, such as their on-watch training program and provides res response services as victims become survivors through residential safe house programs, emergency services, and economic empowerment. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that I, Lynn Deutsch, Mayor of the City of Dunwoody, do hereby recognize the efficacy of education as a human trafficking prevention tool and call upon the citizens and employees of Dunwoody to recognize our vital role in ending all forms of human trafficking and encouraging everyone to educate themselves through training. This proclamation, along with the strengthening of local ordinances and enforcement efforts, affirms Dunwoody's commitment to creating a community where everyone has value, dignity, and worth, and to express commitment to come alongside those who are on the front lines of victim identification and the providers who empower a survivor's path to freedom. If you see something that doesn't look right, take action and call the National Human Trafficking Hotline at 888- 373-7888 or text HELP to 233-733. Okay. 
Second. Well, thank you all so much, Mayor Deutsch. Thank you for um, taking this initiative seriously. Tom Lambert, thank you for really being a champion for this issue and for truly making sure that we could um, get Dunwoody to be the second city in the nation to be a city of freedom. And tomorrow is National Human Trafficking Awareness Day. But I am so deeply grateful that you all have taken the initiative to move beyond awareness, truly to education, to impact communities, to spot, report, and prevent trafficking. As somebody who walks alongside survivors of trafficking every day, many of which are all across the nation, that many of which have been trafficked through this area, um, I can tell you that they are grateful. They are grateful because they know that eyes and ears of the communities are exactly what we need to really stand against this mm -hmm. issue and to begin to see it eradicated. Eradication of trafficking is a, um, a big goal, but nothing short of that is worthy of our efforts. So I thank you for truly um, taking freedom seriously and for advocating for those who are still victims um, in order for them to one day become survivors after being identified. So thank you all very much. We appreciate it. And congratulations on becoming the second city of freedom. Thank you. And thank you for your service. We appreciate it. And Councilman Lambert has something to add. Yeah, I'd just like to add one other thing. The, uh, the training program, the OnWatch training program that they offer, I've actually completed it. And I, I just want to say, I, I strongly encourage everyone listening to take it. It's, it's First of all, it's very well done. It's very eye-opening. I learned a lot. A lot of it was quite scary, actually. <laughs> and uh, But the, the training, um, not only is it well done, but it's also very digestible. It's, uh, it's set up in a way that it's easy. There's small, uh, I think there was 10 segments or about five minutes each. So you could pop on for five minutes, watch a segment. It keeps track of where you are. Go back tomorrow, go back next week, go back next month and do another segment. So it's really an easy thing to complete. And it's, it's certainly a worthwhile uh, thing to do. And if you're like me, you'll find it very eye-opening to, to learn that there's a lot of misconceptions about trafficking and what's happening out there and, and how important it is for us to recognize the signs of when it's happening so we can we can get involved. So, so thank you, Christy. And it's free and it's at IamOnWatch.org if anybody would like to take it. Thank you so thank much. You. And we're going to share the, the services and the training on through our social media and website. So thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Councilman Lambert, for leading the way on this. Uh, Eric Litton, when you're ready. Uh, yes, Mayor, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Okay, so we're going to do the um, the city manager's month of report. Um, if you'll uh, pull that document up at your leisure. The, uh, the police, the department's crime response team with additional officers conducted a joint distracted driving detail on North Shallowford and Cotillion, along with the Shambly Police Department and the Governor's Office of Highway Safety. A total of 49 citations were issued, which includes 42 hands-free violation citations. So, um, so that, that law is um, well enforced here in Dunwoody and we wanna help eliminate distracted driving. Also, the officers delivered presents to children along the Peachtree Industrial Boulevard corridor, uh, corridor on Christmas day. And uh, those were some gifts that we had from the, from the drive. The um, also, once again, I always enjoy talking about the license plate readers. And if you'll notice throughout the police portion of the report, it talks about the license plate readers numerous times. 
recovering stolen autos um, and other crimes that have been committed uh, elsewhere and how we can help bring those to a resolution here in Dunwoody. Uh, Public Works, Spalding at Shamley Dunwoody intersection, construction 57 continues to install the concrete curb and sidewalk on the west side of Spalding Drive. That project continues to move along. Also the Georgetown Gateway project in Shamley Dunwoody, Atlanta Gaslight is working on service tie-ins to the new gas main and plans have been, uh, to, uh, been completed to relocate um, those lines all throughout January. Also Winters Chapel Trail phase one, the Atlanta Gaslight has installed 800 feet of new gas mains is expected to complete that work in February. So those projects, once again, are moving forward. Um, maintenance crews cleaned 16 stormwater structures and completed uh, 12 stormwater work orders, two sidewalk repairs, 11 street rep repairs, and 12 sign repairs during the month of December uh, within the department. Uh, also parks, um, we have the Martin Luther King Junior Day of Service, January 17th, 2022. So that's coming up. Also, the parking lot lights will be installed at the former Austin site, what we're calling the Austin Park now, starting this month. Um, all the bands have been scheduled for the extended grooving on the green concert series. It will run from June through October. That's already taking place in terms of the scheduling. And also uh, maintenance staff has completed the leaf removal from Perimeter Center East and along additional right of ways located throughout the, uh, throughout the city. Um, under community development, 445 building inspections were completed during the month of December. Um, the new Publix down the street has received its temporary certificate of occupancy. That will be opening uh, later, right, it's opening. And also part of that was a, um, was a bond to complete the work uh, along Asher Dunwoody Road for the trail system. So that portion of the project has been bonded um, so they can go ahead and open the store. Also, the department removed about 200 illegal signs um, from the right of way. The um, economic development, um, we have the new US headquarters for APIG Lloyd um, coming to Dunwoody, bringing 786 new jobs to Dunwoody investing approximately $18 million in Ravinia III. Um, so that's a great uh, item for Dunwoody. Also information technology, the uh, migration to the cloud for the emails is now completed. We also have, um, we have the registration for our electronics recycling on March 27th. So uh, Jennifer and her department have been promoting that event and also the household hazardous waste recycling on April the 30th. Those are upcoming events as well. Um, finance has worked with the police department on securing and distributing the first responders supplement grant for sworn police department employees. That's something that's uh, upcoming as well. And then the monthly financial report is part of this city manager report. There's a link in your document that will take you to the financial report as well. The, um, and that concludes my report. I, along with the other staff members, are available to answer any questions the council may have. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Anybody have questions? John. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I think it's more of a police question, but it's regarding the license plate readers. Chief, Chief is here. It? Yeah, I see Chief. I also am a big fan of the license plate readers and I noticed there was a incident which happened with a motorcycle and uh, the officers decided not to pursue the uh, suspect. Two questions, Chief, can you just give us an update on the pursue uh, policies just to make sure that everybody knows what those are and then if you could uh, tell us license plate readers, do they work for motorcycles? Absolutely, Any, anything that has a tag on it. So for instance, a trailer, Anything that can be entered into the motor vehicle uh, database. I just thought uh, they might be small, so I wasn't yes. sure if they worked. Yes, absolutely. Uh, as far as uh, Chase, uh, our policy is pretty restrictive. Like most uh, metropolitan cities, uh, we have a uh, Chase policy that uh, says forcible felony only. 
Uh, and so a stolen car is certainly not, doesn't fall into that category. You know, from, from my point of view, it's not worth the risk mm -hmm. uh, for property, for an officer or uh, someone else to get injured or killed over it. Uh, certainly there are uh, times we're going to chase them no matter what mm -hmm. uh, for a serious crime, but not, but not for the minor things. Thank you, Chief. I just thought it was an opportunity to raise that one in the report. Sure. So thank yep. you very much for Absolutely. You're welcome. clarifying. Joe. No. Um, Eric, yeah, thank you again for the report, and I appreciate the structure of especially knowing um, the activity, upcoming activities and events publicly facing. That, that definitely helps. And of course, Public Works, everything they're doing is public facing, and it's ongoing in future. So that's great uh, to hear that. Um, uh, Chief, you can just nod. Are you guys doing the polar plunge there uh, in February still up in uh, Gainesville? Great. Awesome. Looking forward to that. Um, Eric, what's the best way of us finding out when we release RFPs to get... Um, to see what those are. I see down below, we got like a Mount Vernon Road corridor improvements. Um, where can we go? What's the best way? What do you recommend us to, to, to get CC sure. in the loop? Sure, and what we can do on that, I mean, we can certainly add those into the report for one thing. And number two, all that is on the website. Um, John Gates does an excellent job on promoting any kind of RFPs. Well, you know, once they're posted, um, you know, once they've gone public, we put all that on the website. And that's one way that we get the majority of our responses is, th is through our web. And, um, but from that standpoint, we can certainly add the active ones. If you all prefer, we can add that under the finance element. We can actually add a subcategory uh, for purchasing because that's a, that's a very large portion of our finance department as far as the responsibilities. Yeah, that'd be great just to have the link in there in the PDF. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Anybody? Tom. I guess I'm making a threes of trauma on the LPRs here because <laughs> I know Eric and John have mentioned it. I just wanted to just highlight it and uh, thank you, Chief, and your department for, for your efforts here. And, and just to emphasize what an important tool that is for enforcement. Uh, there were a lot of hits on this. And um, it's important not only for capturing the stolen vehicle, but the thing that jumps out to me is how many of those LPR hits when they pulled over the car off for a stolen vehicle there were guns, there were drugs, there were other things. And as chief can tell us or any police officer can tell you, a lot of crime is committed in stolen vehicles. It, they steal the car to go do something so they can't get caught. So um, it's not only a reactive tool to catch people that have stolen a car, it's also a, a preventative tool that can stop crime from happening in the first place. So uh, thank you chief and your department for all you're doing. And I just wanted to make people aware of, of that part of the LPR as well, thanks. Anybody else? All right, thank you, Eric. And for those who haven't attended our meetings during COVID, we, we have re-spaced out. We were back to normal, but we've spread out more. And our staff is primarily reporting from upstairs in their offices. And so therefore, when I call on someone, I look up, just know that I'm not looking to heaven. Um, all right, so, thank you. So I think next is, next is a public hearing, Sharon. Yes, <clears throat> Mayor, I will read the, we provide the first read of the ordinance, an ordinance to amend the zoning conditions of land lot 347, District 18, in consideration of zoning case RZ-21-02 for 11 Ravinia Parkway to authorize a variance from the street frontage requirements. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. The first case is um, under consideration is 11 Ravinia Parkway. This is a rezoning case. Um, the applicant uh, requests to modify the conditions of zoning, and they are also requesting a concurrent variance. The variance is to allow relief from the street frontage requirements on Ravinia Parkway. Just a quick note before I begin. Concurrent variances are a new process for Dunwoody. Um, you all recently approved a text amendment allowing them. Um, this is the first of its nature. Um, variances utilize different approval criteria than the rezoning. So if you have any questions about these criteria or my analysis, I'll be happy to address those later. 
Um, so first, I'm going to give you a little bit of background um, on this property. I'm sure you've all noticed it. It is the um, empty lot um, at the corner of Ravinia and Ashford Dunwoody, right across the street from Best Buy. Um, it's also directly adjacent to 285. This property has gone undergone a series of rezonings. Um, it is currently zoned PC-2, um, but it was originally uh, a part of the um, Ravinia development in 1982. This piece at that time was set aside for transportation and access to the property. And since then, over the course of the next three decades, it's subsequently uh, been proposed for uh, different uses. Um, it was proposed at one point for a high rise office development, and then it was proposed for a restaurant and retail development. And then most recently in 2019, it was slated for a 156 key hotel restaurants and retail. And the uh, site plan is on the right for reference. Currently, um, they are requesting to change the conditions to alter what they're proposing on this property. So they are proposing a 110,000 square foot retail facility, um, specifically furniture real, uh, fit retail. Um, and they will have 24 su uh, surface parking spaces along with 132 subsurface parking spaces. Due to the steep sloping topography on the property, the building will be cantilevered over the parking lot and very few, few spaces will be visible from the road. There will be no vehicular access from Ashford Dunwoody. All access on Ravinia Parkway is taken from Ravinia Parkway. You can see it uh, circled in blue on the screen is the main entrance, and that's how you enter the subsurface parking deck. The uh, courtyard area is highlighted in green. The front entrance from the street is circled in purple. And then there are also two other entrances circled in red and yellow, and these are connected by a driveway, so it creates a horseshoe drive. And then highlighted in purple is their loading dock area where they will drop off goods and also people can pick up um, furniture that they order there as well. Here highlighted in red is the length of frontage where the applicant is requesting this uh, variance from the street frontage. Essentially, they're asking to not have to build the sidewalk in that area. Uh, instead, they are proposing a crosswalk um, across Ravinia Parkway, and that will connect with the existing sidewalk infrastructure uh, that's on the other side of the road. Uh, we feel that, um, uh, excuse me, uh, these are the um, trees along Ravinia Parkway. Um, I just wanted to give you a visual of that. Um, staff feels that these trees can and should be um, adequately protected during and after construction. That's been a great concern of ours um, because these are um, very mature and large oak trees. So um, in the interest of preserving these trees, um, we do recommend some changes to the site plan. Um, we feel that the additional curb cut, so the middle curb cut that in the previous um, slide was circled in red, um, we feel that it needlessly endangers the health of several trees. Um, and we don't feel that it's necessary for the success of this development. Um, we'd recommend that this curb cut and this driveway be removed in an effort to preserve those trees. Um, additionally, as part of the, RAS, um, the applicant's rationalization um, for their variance, they do cite the preservation of these trees as a reason for that. Um, very recently, um, the applicant did provide a tree assessment, and that came in on Friday, so last Friday, um, late in the day. We haven't had um, you know, adequate time to review these uh, new changes, but I just wanted to make you aware of that. We're gonna review this further. Um, and you know, as a result of this new information, our recommendation may change, you know, i.e. the conditions um, might be slightly altered. So I just wanted to make you all aware of that. Uh, some additional information about the property here is a uh, on the left a picture of some trees that the applicant is proposing to preserve. 
um, and that will be in the courtyard area. And you can see on the right-hand side is a rendering of that proposed courtyard area. This is how the building will be viewed from the street, um, just to give you an idea of the design concept. And here are some additional renderings. Overall, um, we're pleased um, with these and we feel that it's in line with the goals um, of heightened, more urban design in the perimeter center. In regards to the requested variance, uh, Public Works um, finds that the proposed crosswalk is an appropriate alternative to the street frontage requirements. Um, currently, um, if they were to build the sidewalk along that frontage, um, first of all, it, it wouldn't lead to anywhere in particular because there's nothing down there. And then second of all, the topography and again, the presence of those large mature trees um, greatly complicate the installation of a sidewalk and planting strip. Um, the requirements of the code don't take into account these types of unique conditions um, and circumstances of individual properties. Um, so that's why we have this variance process in place. Um, in lieu of the required street frontage, um, staff recommends a 20-foot easement to accommodate any future improvements. So if at some point the city does want to go in there and do some sort of connectivity project, um, they have a, the ability to do so. Um, overall, uh, the proposed development is generally consistent with the approval criteria for rezoning and for um, variances. So we do recommend approval of both the modification of conditions and the concurrent variance subject to the conditions and exhibits provided. And again, noting that those uh, conditions uh, will likely alter before the second read. I'm available if you all have any questions. Okay, so this is a public hearing. And so Sharon, I'm having on-base problems myself. So I go into the for and against first, right? Sharon? Yes, okay, that's what I thought. Okay, so, and then the, on. Well, Mayor, I'm, I'm sorry. Right. The question is, is that um, I'm having one base problem, so I can't open the actual agenda in the device. So do I, does the applicant make a presentation first or do we do for and against first? Yes, the applicant makes their okay, presentation. Makes sense, all right. Hearing. Thank you, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, I technically know, but it's fine because we're short people. Yeah, I'm short. No, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. My, my name is Din Webb, 1105 West Peachtree Street, Atlanta, Georgia, 30309, here on behalf of the applicant. Before I begin, let me introduce a couple of folks. Uh, first, uh, in the rear here is Brian Saltikov. Brian is a senior project manager with Living Spaces Furniture. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know, Living Spaces is a California-based modern furniture company. It's got 29 locations, and it represents designers like Jonathan and Drew Scott and Joanna Chip Gaines. Uh, the fellow who's assisting me tonight is uh, Derek Zittrauer. He's with Kimley Horn. I asked Kimley Horn to send their tallest man to uh -huh. uh, deliver tonight. Uh, Matt will do a good job of setting up the, the property and explaining where it is. I'm just going to mention a couple points. Uh, it's 3.45 acres in total. Uh, it's vacant, I think, as most of you know. Uh, and she touched on the zoning history. That zoning history goes back about 40 years. Right. I know the folks who are heavily involved in the VHA are well aware of that. The most recent iteration was for a company called Guyer Morris. And as you heard, they were asking for approval of a 156 key hotel, about 42,000 square feet of retail, and a three level parking deck. And that zoning was approved subject to a particular site plan. And that's why we're here to modify uh, those conditions to allow for a different site plan. Uh, Madeline touched on a little bit of what we want. Uh, it's 110,000 square feet of retail and a single building, 24 surface parks and 132 subsurface parks. I passed out a, a set of elevations just to kind of, so you guys could thumb through. It's not worth going through a page at a time, but it got, does a good job, I think, of representing the, the, the architectural style proposed and sort of the concept and feel of uh, the building, but you'll notice it's a modern design. And importantly, importantly it includes that courtyard on Ashford Dunwoody Road. Um, inside the building itself, there is a showroom, a design center and a cafe. And that cafe actually opens up into the courtyard that you see. And at the cafe, they'll still sell stuff like coffee and espresso, sandwiches, salads, beer and wine and, and whatnot. 
Uh, as Madeline mentioned, there are three curb cut access points all on Ravidian Parkway, which is a private drive. Uh, and we're making a, a great effort to save uh, existing trees at the corner. There are actually about 28 of those oaks that were planted at some point during the, the construction of Ravinia along that stretch in total. So we're saving a band at the corner. I'm gonna talk a little bit more, more about the trees in a minute. Um, we're providing all the required streetscape on Ashford Dunwoody. And as Madeline uh, explained, we're providing about 250 feet down Ravinia Parkway. And at that point, we're providing a crosswalk to go over to an existing set of streetscape improvements on the other side, uh, which everyone's uh, certainly at the staff level seems to think is a good idea. As Madeline mentioned, uh, they're recommending a conditional approval on both of the applications. So I'm gonna abbreviate what I'm gonna talk about tonight uh, so I can get to your questions, but I gotta talk about the big issue and that's the curb cuts. I've handed out a, a three page exhibit that has three items. Number one is the first site plan that we submitted. So this is where we started. The second page is the revised site plan. And the third page is the uh, tree impact plan that Madeline touched on a little bit. And just to, to walk you through the original concept plan, uh, you see the northernmost curb cut, as Madeline said, that's the primary entrance that leads you to a small parking area at street level and to 132 spaces that are underground. And the middle, curb cut and the south curb cut are designed for customer pick pickup and more importantly, truck delivery. If you read the staff report, you'll note that they're interested in, like we are in preserving trees. And they asked as part of that consideration to think about removing that, uh, removing the middle curb cut. And we did take a hard look at that option. Uh, and we feel like it is critically important here for a couple of reasons. This U-shaped area that you see defined by the boundary of the middle curb cut and the southernmost curb cut is for truck circulation. So the idea is that a truck, an 18-wheeler, will pull in that middle uh, curb cut, pull down, angle back towards Ravinia Parkway, then back into the loading dock. And if this middle, or excuse me, this horseshoe configuration in there, the only option is for that 18-wheeler to stop in Ravinia Parkway and back onto the property, which we don't think is a good option. Uh, it's also, uh, this horseshoe configuration is also designed to try and uh, keep the, certainly the, the vehicular customer away from the, the larger trucks as well. My understanding is that uh, Living Spaces has, does about 25% online business. So some of those uh, online customers will have their material shipped to them at their houses, but other folks come and pick it up. And so we want to keep those away from the trucks too. What we did though, was find what we think is a, a good alternative to to try and save the trees another way. Again, if you compare the first page of this exhibit, which is where we start, you'll notice that in the middle of the horseshoe, there are 13 parking spaces on the east side of that driveway that front Ravinia Parkway. Now, if you turn the page, you'll see that we took those parking spaces out. That creates about a 23 to 24 foot pervious area uh, that we think is adequate, uh, certainly to uh, make a great attempt at preserving those trees. We think it's a reasonable alternative, and we also think it really gets at the heart at what the staff is, is advocating for here, which is trying to keep uh, as many trees as we can. So we took that new plan to the Planning Commission. It liked the idea, it recommended approval of it, and we hope you'll consider it as well. And this tree impact plan is something we created since the Planning Commission. We, we realized we, it's hard to talk about you know, trees and making an effort to save trees without having some kind of an exhibit to show you what the impact will be. I, I just told Derek that for the next iteration of this plan, I want the trees we're saving to be shown in green because there are actually 28 trees here. If you look at the corner of, uh, of Ashford Dunwoody and Ravinia Parkway, for example, there are you know 10 or so trees that are just balled up in there that you don't, can't really even see. And it's also a similar situation to, for the trees to, the, to uh, the east side of the site or southeast. All you really see are the trees in orange, which is the trees that'll, that you know, or theoretically could be removed from the site. The three that you see in the middle, so you, you've got one large tree at the primary access point, and you've got uh, three trees grouped together. Those are the trees that would be impacted by the proposed uh, middle curb cut. And again, there are about 28 trees, and that one change really only affects three. So uh, I think I'm going to stop there. I'm happy to take any questions you have. I'll reserve my time, and we hope that when you come back in two weeks, uh, we'll get a recommendation of approval subject to a revised plan and some conditions that we're still working through a little bit with on the staff. Thank you. Okay, um, so now I'm going to open the public hearing. Anyone speaking for this project? Um, I don't, uh, just come on up. You'll have 10 minutes. 
Anybody speaking against the project? Come on up and you'll have 10 minutes. All right, so, oops, I have to first open the public hearing, I apologize. I'm opening the public hearing. Are there any objections? No, seeing none, I've asked people if they wanna speak. Uh, I'll close the public hearing unless there's objections. The public hearing is closed. And um, now we will go to questions of staff and the applicant. Um, I'll start on John's end. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions then. Let's talk about those trees and that tree, the curb cut first thing. Um, so I'm looking at the third page okay. and it looks like you're trying to save those three trees right in the curve. Is that what I'm looking at? The ones in yellow that are not orange, the orange ones are gone, right? Yeah, actually that, that's a good point. I'm glad you asked about this, the color. So the, the orange are the trees that will be removed. Uh, there are two, or excuse me, three on the north and south that have nothing to do with the curb cut. They're just impacted for other reasons. That yellow you see is where we're impacting the critical root zone. So that's that's the purpose for that. All right. So the three you see, there's right one. the the one the right on the curve, right? I mean that's the like at the bottom, the right in the curve at the bottom. There's three there in a row. Yeah. Right. So down. I'm thinking right where you're down, 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 yeah, down. Right, right where your parking spots were. You're taking out the parking spots. Correct. I'm trying to understand you taking out the parking spots and why. Got it. All right, so this area here yeah. that doesn't show orange, the area between Correct. the two right. orange. That's so that's the area where we remove the parking to try and save those particular trees. Okay, so you remove parking in order to save the trees. Correct. Did you move that exit or that entrance to the horseshoe, the top entrance to the horseshoe, did you move that south at all? As far as I know, it's in the same spot. Let me ask Eric to respond to that. <laughs> yeah, and if, if you look at the, so in, in the exhibit might be a little bit small, but if you see some line work on there, what we used was truck turn software to show that. Mm -hmm. So if that curb was moved down further to the south, that semi wouldn't be able to successfully make that turning movement. There's some pretty talented truck drivers. I'm not sure, yeah. but <laughs> the software is not as talented as the drivers. Um, all right. So by putting that horseshoe entrance in, we're still losing those four, those three large now yet orange trees at the top of the horseshoe entrance. Correct. Yeah. And I think one thing that's important there, that tree actually to the south of the entrance, we had some conversation about um, because a lot of with the critical root zone, what we would have to do is engage an arborist to give recommendations on what it looks like to save that tree. So there is an effort we could put forth to try to save that, but just with the location of that driveway and the construction activity, we didn't think it would be advisable to put that in the same category as those other trees. So to directly answer your question, yes, those three trees are the ones that we assume we need to be removed. Okay. Um, this building is gonna be there for the next 50 years. I'm not sure I'm gonna make 50 years. I'm not sure this business is gonna make 50 years. I hope they're successful and there forever. Um, highest and best use of that property, we have gone through office towers, hotels, numerous uses. And I just uh, wanna make sure that what we're putting there is the highest and best use. You have a valid application, we're looking at it seriously. And uh, I'm just trying to understand if it's the right thing for right there. And because again, there's been a whole lot more upzoned compared to where you're coming forward today. So, it's not the ideal for me, but it, it can work. Um, I'm looking at photos of other living space facilities in the United States and how they're built out. And I'm trying to understand how your drawings are going to compare to what I'm seeing online because some of them just look like boxes, all one color. These and some had big stones, some had other details. Explain to me your details in the sense of the look of this building. Um, I see it being brownish. I see lots of glass. And then I'm, I'm seeing accents that are browner in color that are different than the, than the main color. I'm just trying to understand what I'm looking at. Because again, I'm, I'm trying to compare it to your other boxes that are available that I'm seeing online. Okay, so if you turn to, I wish these were numbered actually. There's a page that shows the construction materials used. It looks like it's 
seven or eight in, hold on one second, there's one. So it's the ninth page. So it's, it- uh, Show us what it looks like, just to show us. Okay. So it talks about, uh, you know, some of the materials uh, that generate the look, painted concrete panels uh, in the reposed gray color uh, for, uh, you know, one side of the structure, exposed steel painted black, wood, I can't read that exactly. You guys, did you find the right page? In the presentation online, I can't necessarily read it because the print, but you can, it's here. Correct. Right. It's in one of the captures and it says like local gray granite stone. Is that what you're talking about, John? Yeah, I'm seeing it. Right. Yeah. So we spell out the construction materials. It is hard to read and, on this exhibit, but it's yeah. there. And I can maybe get a, a little bit easier to read list. It's just in black and white. It's a, a, Again, I'm seeing other build outs of right. the same company, which has maybe a greater use of accents higher stone use, higher looks, higher quality looks versus the painted concrete panels. Let me ask Brian to come up. I, he's the, okay, uh, I'm, just, I'm just trying to understand what you're offering. So, um, oh, my name is Brian Saltikov. I'm with Living Spaces, um, 5723 Cali Rosa in San Clemente, California. Um, and if you could adjust the microphone so that you're speaking into it as much as possible. Thank you. Is this better? Sorry, I'm not the best public speaker. You're I'm good, sir. Just speak up. You're fine. Hammer and nails kind of guy. Um, so what you saw online, that's our sort of typical large single story footprint, sort of like a prototype that we try to repeat. Those are mostly in Texas. The limestone uh, that you see is indigenous to Texas. Here in Dunwoody, they're going for a different look, mainly to fit on the site. The site is a little bit challenging for us to get, you know, that that size of a retail footprint on there. So they're going to the, the three story. Um, so the underground parking, the two stories. Um, the designers, they, we try to, um, you know, incorporate the brand colors. Those are, you see those browns those, and those earth tones. Those are um, brand colors. Um, there's a lot of the, the glazing, the, the uh, storefront that you see um, sort of fits in, I think, more with the uh, perimeter area. You see a lot of that around in this area as well. So, <clears throat> again, um, um, I'm more of a hammer and nails kind of guy. I'm not the designers. I can't speak specifically. And I know, um, you know some of these materials, you know, they're subject to change, as, you know, if, they're, if we're able to even procure specific ones given you know, the market conditions and sort of the uncertainty. Um, so right now, you know, it is a concept and, um, you know, we, we think it's a, a nice product. Uh, hopefully we hope you agree as well. Okay. So if there's, you know, any specific things that we can answer, I can always circle back with the architects. And well, I'm sure others will touch on the amenities and maybe the restaurant. And I'm interested in hearing all of that. The other thing that I pulled off from looking at your website was that you have outlet centers and distribution centers. This is your first place in Georgia. That's right. Tell me, is this going to be an outlet center as well? No, this is, this is strictly um, retail, um, sort of destination shopping. Um, usually our outlet centers, uh, it's sort of a new concept for us the last couple of years. Um, they're attached to a large distribution center. Uh, we're currently working on one right now in Humboldt, Texas. Um, it's attached to about a 600,000 foot uh, distribution center. And we've got about 120,000 square foot of outlet center um, with sort of nicer finishes. It doesn't have like the typical sort of warehouse look to it inside. It's got finishes, um, LVT flooring, um, conditioned space as well. Uh, this particular site, we're currently looking for a, about a 50,000 square foot cross dock. So it would, you know, um, the product would ship from Texas and go straight through the cross dock, either to the store or to the customer's uh, residence. And we also are in the process of looking for a larger sort of 600, 800,000 square foot distribution center in Atlanta area. Um, and there could be, you know, potentially a, a 
uh, an outlet center attached. But to this is your one and only store in Georgia is, at yeah, the moment. This is our first. Uh, this is our the furthest east we've we've stretched out so far. So this is our first foray into this market. All right, well, then I guess my request would really be, I want to see a little bit more of the finishes, just try, if there's ways in which you could tie down the painted concrete somehow, I just, I wasn't sure what that meant. Like, like a, um, like a materials, physical samples? Again, we, it's the higher end finishes, that, that section of the city, I want to kind of know what's going there. So more detailed. A little bit more detailed. I mean, I'm seeing what glass and I'm seeing walls, but I'm not seeing what those walls are made out of, what they look. I'm just trying to compare it against your other stores and what you're looking at to see how this compares. Right, our, our, our typical um, stores are tilt up concrete with the finishes that you see, the pop outs, um, the different color bands um, and the signage as well. Um, and this is, a, uh, this is a different product. Than well, it's a very large building. It's a lot of roof surface area and, you know, who knows? Maybe you can put that restaurant on a rooftop, uh, uh, roof, rooftop sure, uh, living. Sure. So yeah, anyway, uh, just I, I, I'm done questioning. Sure, I just wanted. Sure. To... I can circle back with the material. All right. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for your uh, answers, and thank you, Ben. Uh, go ahead, Joe. So um, I'm a big process guy. So you gave us some changes tonight, Madeline. You presented some stuff to us. What has changed? From the last time this was presented and voted on by the Planning Commission, what have we been introduced to new that the Planning Commission has not seen or had input on? There's nothing. I mean, the, the tree exhibit you see is new. Uh, they didn't consider it as part of the deliberation, but it really it was generated out of that conversation, right? Talking about how trees will be impacted by the middle curb cut. We definitely discussed that. We, we showed them the two site plans you see at pages one and two here. We just started thinking we need to sort of better understand that ourselves because when we're talking about saving trees or providing recompense on the rest of the property, we need to, I need a little bit more understanding. So that that's what this was generated for. Because really in terms of the request, I don't, there's nothing different. All right, you concur, Madeline, on that. What, okay, thanks. Um, so I've got a few different, this might be directed more to staff or not, but um, let's see, I've got a bunch of handwritten notes. Do we have a, so the current conditions, and I, I sent an email back to staff this afternoon, looking at what was currently zoned, the difference of pervious versus impervious, um, what's presented now versus what is currently approved. Um, like to get that idea of, um, I would like to know what kind of reduction of heat island, reduction of stormwater drainage, what kind of sustainable treatment, a green roof, et cetera. Is any of that, under consideration, that's that's another one. I could, if you want to respond, or I could just give you the list, Madeline. Do you want to kind of interject a few bit? Then, then? thanks. So I did look at the previous rezoning from 2019. Um, unfortunately, in all of the rezoning documents, I could not find a lot coverage calculation. Um, however, eyeballing it, it looks essentially the same, and um, they'll abide by the maximum lot coverage restrictions for the perimeter center zoning district, which I believe is 80%. Mm -hmm. And is the applicant entertaining any above and beyond for the green roof, the heat island reduction, you know, an additional no, gray so water recycling, stormwater drainage, pervious, um, impervious, you know, pervious pavers? Those things. No, the the site plan is not uh, fully engineered. It's not uh, immensely detailed, so that's not discussed in the application. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not discussed. So if it's not in the application, then it's one of these. We could ask them, but they don't have to do it. But we could put it as a condition potentially. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'll just again. These are conversations. Um, would the applicant be willing to put in a nice sign at the roof that says "Welcome yeah. to Dunwoody"? We actually talked about that. Yeah. We actually talked about it, yeah. We, we can Welcome to, talk about that. Certainly not a gateway, yeah, gateway I, signage. I, 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 let me, you know, I'm, I'm making this here. Two, two, it's, it's either a gateway signage at the at grade, um, we, right? We work, um, or up on the on the roof. Okay. Hold on one second. We can make sure. Can yeah, sure. So just you always ask. That's that's fun stuff. 
Just Got it. again, based on what happens with, we have a wait, wayfinding initiative happening this current year. Um, any other considerations about going to, it's, it's you know, the <coughs> under, under uh, uh, parking, but if you think about trying to expand green space, the, the footprint of going up three stories instead of two, and then all of a sudden we, we've got all sorts of more green uh, space to work with, unaccommodating a loading dock and et cetera. I mean, again, I, I can, we can talk a little bit about that. That's not something we talked about. Yeah. Up all night. And then the, um, so in the packet that the staff presented on page 11, it talks about in the Northern curb cut associated driveway and 13 spaces adjacent to Riviera Parkway, needlessly endanger endanger several healthy trees, prohibit any future installation of frontage improvements consistent with the overlay. So Madeline, if you could help me uh, just clarify, is I still see the, that part, are we, is staff recommending that this Northern parking spaces be eliminated? Is that what staff is recommending? That it says for these 13 spaces adjacent to Ravinia parking? So the 13 spaces uh, referenced in my staff report. Yes. Um, I think I, when I was amending my staff report, I didn't uh, amend that correct portion. So the 13 parking spaces was referencing their previous site plan where they showed 13 parking spaces between the two southernmost curb cuts, which they did remove those 13 parking spaces, but they're still keeping the curb cut and the driveway again, which uh, staff feels the curb cut and the driveway still needlessly endanger several of those trees. Okay, yeah, because I was just reading the sentence alone and I'm reading it in the northern curb cut and thinking that's the northern parking thinking that you were recommending eliminating that, those parking spaces in that northern section. So we didn't recommend that, but if okay. that's something you choose to do. Well, it's shifting around space. I, I'm shifting around space. Um, so, and just back to the loading dock and stuff. Um, of course, I'm not a transportation engineer, i.e. a trans tractor trailer engineer, but are there examples nationwide of what you're proposing for the staff to eliminate the bottom, you know, do a back in, back out. What what would happen if we stuck with the staff recommendation for eliminating that curb cut and just having that back one? How do tractor trailers engage and come in and out of there with, with that proposal? Well, the only option is to, you know, basically come down to Ravinia Parkway, pull past the site on the road with cars driving around, back it in, you know, uh, I mean, it just to me, it's crazy. I mean, you would never, as a municipality, encourage somebody to use, you know, a public traveling road to back up and turn around a tractor trailer. But that, that's that's the way it would have to work. That's the really mm -hmm. only way to get in and out of the site. Or not only the tractor trailers, but the delivery vans and trucks for the cafe, as well as the folks coming to pick up whatever furniture they've ordered on the front. Richard, do you mind to chime in just to say, um, for examples, or, you know, best so, practice? Uh, all over Atlanta. And any big cities are very small footprints of buildings and they uh, unfortunately have to maneuver those trucks. On this roadway, each lane is two lanes wide. So the truck can pull down there, traffic can go by and it backs right in. So um, we felt it was more important to save those trees uh, than a third curb cut. Yeah, no. Me, me coming from the army, you always have a ground guide when you're backing up anyway. So if you got two lanes, the guys pulling in there, and then so it's a matter of a couple of minutes, uh, they're they're out of that. Um, all right, let me see what the. This is 110,000 square feet. Is there a reference of what what it what did that look like around here? What other retail stops are about 110,000? Just for reference, point of reference. Um, I don't know if you could just as a takeaway. I don't know. Just to, how do I example? Is it the uh, you know. Is it a Bed Bath & Beyond? Is it a uh, Rooms to Go? I mean, what? just an idea. Um, Richard, do you have an example? No. Yeah, right. Um, page nine on the PDF, it talks about the applicant request relief for installing the 660 foot required street frontage along Ravinia. Was that also in the existing piece uh, zoning, the, the prior? Was that also exempted in the, in the, in, as is it today? 2019? Yeah. I don't think it was. 
Yeah, so oh. that, that was a complete, there was development yeah. all the way to the east. Okay, okay, okay. Right. okay. Um, the crosswalk, and I sent the email, I'm a big proponent of raised crosswalks as traffic calming as well. Um, I understand, confirm this, um, Ravinia Parkway is privately owned? Is Correct. that? Yes. Okay. So we don't know what the posted speed limits are there, but um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of a raised crosswalk instead of just painting, because you know if you just paint white lines. So um, if you could entertain that with our public works director and so on, look at what a raised crossing would look like. It just helps it feel safer <coughs> and people to walk across. We'll and, take that to, uh, there's an HOA for Ravinia. Yeah. And actually the engineer just mentioned to me, there's a height restriction. It's imposed by the HOA and the building height that we're showing here on this plan is as tall as the HOA will allow, or at least the HOA documents. Until they were approved to build the eight-story hotel. Well, I mean, on this property, right? I'm sure there but they, are- they're, in, they're improved. It is an approved eight-story hotel right now on the plan. Oh, interesting. Okay, I thought it was just one parcel. The current plan right now is approved. Yes, okay. All right, and back to the crosswalks. I also am a- on the on Ashford Dunwoody, there's a right turn slip lane um, onto Ravinia Parkway. Um, and I know in the existing conditions there, I appreciate we had already approved uh, like a, putting a pedestrian island on the north side of the intersection, uh, condition number four. I'm a big proponent of that, that's supportive. Um, in conjunction, I would also like to entertain on the Ashford Dunwoody, that right turn slip lane into Ravinia. If we could just raise that crossing as well. I mean, right, it's just, it's just a white striped line. And it and cars just treat, treat it as a shh. they're gonna so again raising that it just adds to safety for people on foot um, on that little little slip lane there. Um, I think I might have done it free space. Yeah. So anyway, I think I've got. Oh, let me just double check my email. Um, yeah, lead measures, anything like that would be nice to know about. Um, it is are all those things you just read off in the email you sent to staff? I, I hope I got it. I got um, <laughs> most of those in the email to staff. I will make sure um, a couple of things that we just talked about. So yeah, okay. I sent a mail in early, but yeah. Um, yeah, that's okay. <coughs> um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Right, go ahead, Stacy. I just um, have a couple questions of clarification. So right now, Heinz owns the Grassy Knoll. Or who owns the grassy knoll? Heinz. Who? Heinz or a Heinz related entity is my Okay. So who will, is Living Spaces buying the land and the building or is Heinz the property oh, developer man. building the building? And who's going to own it? My understanding is that Living Spaces is actually buying the property and will own it and the building. Buying the land and the property? Yes. Okay. Um, so, I like Magnolia and Property Brothers as much as the next person, um, but I'm looking at the about us in living spaces and it just says, we're committed to making your shopping experience as great and wonderful as, as we can. What do we do with 110,000 square foot furniture shopping space that is owned by a company in California when the TV personalities get divorced and their show goes away? We've talked about that. Uh, so we, you know, that we do have a plan B. The idea is it's a co-working space. So it would park and it's, I mean. I, Where does that live? Like, can we put that? Because what I don't want to end up with as a gateway, 110,000 square foot empty building that we don't know what to do with. Right. Uh, understood. That, that Again, that's a fair concern and one we've thought through as well. And we believe because of the architecture of the outside of the building and the open space or certain the layout internally that it would make an ideal co-working space and it would park. So that is an option we think would fit into what's going on in a central perimeter now would make sense today, frankly, um, uh, or at least in a non-COVID time. <laughs> Makes sense in the not too distant future. So there is a plan B, there is an option for this property if, you know, God forbid, living space goes out of business. Okay. Um. As you know, I always like to jump around my questions. You never know what you're going to get from me. Um, <laughs> so the question with the, if we don't allow the middle curb cut, are there still parking spaces there? I didn't understand that. So, I mean, we, we bounced around trying to figure out a way to respond to staff's condition, but with the way staff has now drawn the plan, there would, their 
cutoff effectively for the middle driver would just be north of those or page north of those four spaces do you see mm -hmm. um so from that point down i think the, the layout's essentially the same as we proposed okay. so there would be 10 spaces in that area um and this is having uh older parents who have to have handicapped parking can you tell me where is the handicapped parking how many spaces and what is the access from the underground parking to the store so there's going to probably be there's going to be a few different buckets there where um, so what we've tried to do is if you look at those 10 spaces that Dan was just referring to there'd probably be an ADA spot down there. And it's more from an equity perspective of when we have different pockets of surface parking, we would allocate a space to each one of those. The majority of it that would be underneath the building would have, my understanding is that the elevator, there would be an elevator that would bring you up from that ground level parking onto the showroom okay. level. Um, my next question that you know, there's no rhyme or reason, um, the 285 managed lanes. How does that impact this and will it still look good? I know that's a big TBD, so I'll just throw that one out there. <laughs> it might be a rhetorical question. Yeah, I would say the best answer we have for you this time is we're working with uh, Public Works on the concept plans that have been prepared and we're making sure that the appropriate rooms allocated for those improvements. Um, so it's not the most direct answer, but we, we are having those conversations with staff to make sure it's accommodated. Let me add one thing to that. So at some point before my involvement, um, Derek from Kimlinghorn got an, an overlay effectively of the site from Michael Smith and put that on this property. And the, the building you see is not where he where Derek started, okay? Because mm -hmm. of that uh, area, uh, we had to make a modification to the shape of the building. So we had another call with Michael today and we're gonna run back. We've asked for a, a new overlay effectively so we could run it on this building and we'll okay. be able to make sure we've but we've attempted to and think we left the area that that 285 improvement needs. We're just making sure right now. And my one last question is actually for Brian. What would I have seen on the, on, I was just out in Arizona. What would I have seen just right alongside I-10, just west of Phoenix? I mean, it was a living spaces. Is that just a distribution center? Is that a warehouse? I mean, it was just literally right on the side of I-10. Yeah, it, it's a distribution center and a retail showroom. So. Um, back of house is the distribution center and the front is a fully finished out retail showroom. I wish I would have walked in there. I didn't have other things to do. Okay, I'm done. Catherine. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question on the critical root zone. If you have your impacted trees, you've got seven trees. If you lose them after construction, I assume, will you be replacing them? Or greenery of some sort? Well, I'll try this a couple of different ways. Number one, uh, we are already going to have to compensate for almost all of those seven trees somewhere on the property. So we'll be planting uh, additional BBH somewhere else on the property even now. Um, I, I think we're open to a condition. Uh, I really haven't had that thought. I mean, we're focused on actually trying to save them. Right. But if we were to lose them, I think we would absolutely be agreeable to a condition where we say, look, within, you know, we will plant a tree of X size, assuming it can be done, um, you know, because there's a huge root ball mm -hmm. <laughs> in the ground. But let me follow up on that. We, if we lose a tree and we can replant something good there, we'll do it. But I need to get a little more information on that. Okay. That's all I had. Thanks, Dan. Rob. All right. Um, I just have a couple of issues. One is uh, to kind of jump on some of the sustainability issues that um, Joe raised. Um, is there any plan or or uh, any willingness for lead certification for the building construction for this site? Uh, I'm just taking that down. I'll, I, okay. I can't answer that now. Okay. We're gonna... so that, that's my question. Is I'd be interested to see if the builder would be willing to do a lead certification. And then the other question is, and looking through the packet for the, uh, I guess the the open space, I'm um, kind of at the north side um, along Ashford Dunwoody. It's not real clear to me what that area is going to look like. Some of the sketches have kind of a fence and some picnic tables. Then you go further in the packet, and there's you know a dozen different conceptual designs. Um, I guess I'd be interested in, in more of a concept of what that might look like. You talking uh, about the courtyard? 
yeah, I, I guess what, whatever the green, it's like the green lawn and kind of open area, kind of what that might look like. And if there's um, any consideration that uh, that might be made for some sort of art installation there or something that that's kind of right as you come into the city. So if right. you had some kind of sculpture or something, I think that that might be kind of a, a nice aesthetic addition to that. But I, I would just be interested to know what that might look like. So those are those are my two, I guess, questions or issues. All right, hold on one second. What is she saying? Oh. This. You have that, and then if you go like way deep into our packet, there's a whole bunch of different designs that don't look like that. So I guess I just. Yeah, let me try and match it up. I'm not sure the order of these. They're, they're, this, these images came out of a much larger collection of images. So mm -hmm. let me see if I can put it together in a way that makes sense. I'll, I'll work on that. Tom. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, and uh, my, my questions, I'm gonna kind of revisit some of the things, but I'll try to expand on them rather than rehash what's already been said. Um, and Madeline, some of these will pertain to you. I don't know if you just wanna Pop up, uh, pop up now, or or when it, when it's uh, when it's appropriate. Um, my first question uh, deals with condition five, which is the uh, kind of that southeastern portion, um, and it was part of the condition for for not doing the streetscaping and saving the trees and dedicating a twenty foot easement to the city um, down there. And you know. I never look a gift horse in the mouth. I appreciate saving the trees, but the skeptic in me says this isn't about saving trees. It's about money and the cost of putting the sidewalk in there. So uh, that's fine. As long as we can save those trees, I'm good. That's good with me. But that piece of property is kind of based on the rest of the development, kind of looks like a throwaway for, for the developer. Uh, and so what I would like to see this changed a little bit, uh, because just getting that 20 foot easement presents the city with the same problem. Are we going to go in and remove all those mature trees to put in the sidewalk? Probably not, probably a more desirable thing. If we ever were to do something would be to kind of take it down that slope and maybe behind the trees, maybe to connect to perhaps a future multi-use trail that might go underneath GDOT's project. We, the bottom line is we don't know what's gonna be there, especially with the big uncertainty with GDOT. So I would love to have some more flexibility and rather than just a 20 foot easement from the curb, I would love to see, or, or a dedication, I'd love to see uh, more of a, flexibility with a 20 foot easement that anywhere in that piece of property that we deemed appropriate to perhaps put a trail through there at some future point, if it became viable, uh, that would be my preference. Tom, as it, Tom, you're talking about like the tail. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. The little, yeah. The little panhandle there. Yeah. Um, because I, you know, I went on JS and I was playing with it and like at the narrowest point, it's about 40 feet at the widest part, it's a little under 80 feet. Um, so there's really nothing you can do there with the trees there. So I would just like to have the flexibility to, to put a, a trail wherever it would be most appropriate there. Again, dealing with the landscape, the, uh, um, the, the, the landscape issues and the slope there. Um, so if, if you would consider changing that condition uh, to those terms, that would be favorable for me. Um, condition number eight deals with the tree removal. And, and I'll say this, I'm, I, I do appreciate um, your efforts to save trees here. And I also appreciate you guys being up front with us with this latest uh, thing and, and coming to us and let us know, hey, these trees may be in danger, rather than getting out there and moving the dirt around and the bulldozers say, well, you know, this has got to come down now. Uh, so, because that's that's happened before, where we've gotten a site plan where trees are getting saved and then construction starts and the trees disappear. And once that happens, there's nothing you can do about it. So I do appreciate you being up front about that. With that said, I want to do everything possible to, to save those trees. I know, you know, Condition eight, you already mentioned a little bit about a one-to-one -one, uh, replacement. I'll be honest with you from, and again, not, um, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, but on a big project like this, the cost of placing a couple of trees, you know, versus saving them is, is a throwaway for you guys. So I don't think there's much incentive as a developer to, to put a lot of effort into saving those trees. Um, so I would like to either make every effort to change the plan to accommodate that. And one way it might be down at the bottom, since you know, I do support, and I'll get a little bit more into this later, the removing that middle curb cut 
And in doing so, we could probably get some concrete out of there to get out of those critical root zones for those three trees in the middle uh, where the parking spaces used to be and save those. Um, but I like the conditions to have a little bit more impact uh, for the tree removal to, to make sure that every effort is being made and that if in fact they do have to go, because these aren't just, this isn't just you know a bunch of pine trees. These are you know three foot diameter, mature oak trees with beautiful canopies. These are, these are statement trees and, and they really need to, to be saved. So um, I'd, I'd like to have the, uh, the tree removal and condition eight be a little bit more impactful. Um, regarding the site plan, uh, again, Rob, Rob touched on this, the plaza area, um, looking at the site plan, looking at the renderings, I'm having a difficult time, is, is that that main courtyard area, is that gonna be some sort of impervious pavers? Is it gonna be just concrete? I uh, would like to have a little bit more definition on what's going to be there. Um, and the Ashford Dunwoody streetscape. I've got some confusion here. Um, it's the, the, the application says it's basically, you know, again, we're making modifications to the original zoning. Um, the, the initial uh, approved, the existing pr approved zoning calls for um, an eight foot uh, multi use path and an eight foot. Uh, uh, landscape buffer. Um, and unless I'm reading it wrong, the site, both the site plan and the renderings have flip-flopped the order of that. So they're, they're showing the sidewalk up at the curb and then the landscape buffer between the, the, the sidewalk and the building. The initial site plan for the approved zoning shows, as it should be, the landscape buffer between Ashford Dunwoody and, and the multi-use trail. So I just want to be, and, and also the rendering showed that same way with the sidewalk out at the street and the landscape. So I want to ensure that landscape buffer is in fact a buffer <laughs> and is Madeline between the, to, I'm just, does Madeline need to come answer your question? Uh, if, if she, if she, if she knows the answer, that'd be great. <laughs> I, I can answer okay. it. So we are showing an eight foot landscape strip and an eight foot sidewalk, but it's a little confusing. I think that honeycomb you see, because we were trying to identify the right of way in that area, but we're, we're basically proposing the same streetscape that was already approved back in 2019. Okay. But there, there so was what's some, next to the street? The sidewalk is next to the street, the way I'm reading the site plan, and also in the renderings, the sidewalk is next to the street. There are some of the renderings uh, that show the sidewalk up to the curb. Yeah, and I, I can't speak to the renderings. I can tell you from the site plan, it's, it's absolutely the street buffer, eight feet, the sidewalk, eight feet. And I actually had, it, for any level of comfort, it is a copy and paste exercise from the previous zoning where that cross section is identical and the right of way dedication to the previous conditions. So okay. along Ashford. Dunwoody. And I actually even did pull up the site plan from the original zoning and they are different. It's, it clearly shows landscape buffer, trail, building. Right. Uh, it, again, I'm, I'm not an engineer, no, but I'm not. It, we can revise. <laughs> I just want to make sure that's that's clear that that's how that, that will be uh, constructed. It, it will be. Okay. It's an eight foot street buffer and then the sidewalk outside of that. And there's a okay. node here sort of towards the bottom, probably quarter of that streetscape section that says, Ashford Dunwoody Street frontage, eight foot street buffer, eight foot multi use path for that street. Yeah, yeah. And again, as long as that's what's going in, I'm I'm happy. I just want to be, because I didn't read it, the site plan or the renderings don't depict it that way. So sure. since it's a site plan approval, I want to make sure we're getting what we think we're getting. Um, okay, let's see. Site plan. Okay. Um, exhibit, uh, exhibit C, that's about the curb cuts. I do support uh, the staff's recommendations on that um, and, and removing that, that center curb cut. Um, you know, the, the, the question has been made about the trucks and, and Richard kind of pointed out that that happens everywhere in, in cities. Um, you know, and quite, quite frankly, that's, you know, that is a private road that kind of loops around. There's an in and out, there's two ways in and out of there. My experience there is your heavy volume on that portion of the road will be in the morning when people are coming into the office. The rest of the day, there's practically no traffic there. It's all going out at the end of the day. So I, I would imagine that deliveries can be scheduled to accommodate the traffic schedule to make that least intrusive. Also looking, and again, I know these aren't exactly the scale, but looking at the um, little diagram of the truck going through your little U and it looks like the cab still has to get out onto the Ravinia Parkway anyway to perform that U-turn. So you're blocking the road anyway, so you might as well uh, get rid of that center curb cut uh, if, if we're going to be doing that anyway. So um, that that's what I'd like to say. And I'd also, th this would be more for Madeline. Um, 
for the um, when this comes before us for a vote, I want to ensure that the site plan accurately reflects if in fact we're doing this modification uh, that that is inflected, reflected on the site plan because the current site plan in the packet does not show that. So I want, again, I just want to make sure we're approving a site plan specific uh, rezoning that the site plan shows. And, and that way we could also see specifically where we're going to get from as far as, you know, what parking may be there, how it might impact the trees and all of that. So um, I believe that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I have a, just a couple things. One, to Joe's point about a Dunwoody sign somewhere on the side or front, and to Rob's point about public art, those are very important. This is, so to me, I understand, and if Dem feels like he needs to explain how we got here, I mean, we've seen the zoning history. To me, this is not necessarily the greatest use of this land. However, I understand that the HOA management in Ravinia limitations of IHG and the hotels that this is not exactly what I would want, but it's not terrible. Um, which is, you know what I mean? Like I always envisioned some big shiny high rise there, but I understand the concerns of those building owners in Ravinia that traffic pre-COVID anyway is enough and they much more interested in a low impact use. And I respect that. I want it to John's point to look like a shiny, I mean, to me, something that belongs in a dense urban area, even though it's relatively low dense um, use. Um, and so I want it to look like what we think Ravinia and new other new construction in the perimeter looks like. Um, the because it is people turn off the interstate, well, who knows what the interstate's gonna function like, but right now people turn off the interstate and they're in Dunwoody and they're in perimeter, um, which is a sophisticated commercial area. And that's what we're striving for. Um, I'm a little confused. So this is the same parcel though, that we rezoned for the hotel or is this parcel smaller? Than the re so Madeline, is this the same piece of property or is it only part of that piece of property? Is it? It's the same piece of property. Okay. The uh, lot lines have not been adjusted. Okay. So I'm not totally sure. I, I guess it's the placement of the building is the problem why we can't go up to three stories. Um, because I wouldn't mind if it was three stories and um, was leaving more green space. I think we've got to figure out um, the curb cut. Part of the inherent beauty of, and what makes Ravinia different than say something you'll find in Brookhaven or Sandy Springs is the tree-lined gateway. And it was done intentionally. Like you said, those trees were planted. So I anticipate the next week or so you'll work that out with staff. Um, and I think that's all I have for now. Anybody else? All right, oh, John. I'd just like to agree with the public art aspect and that Ashford Dunwoody and that intersection and the views coming off the highway, that's, that's, that's Dunwoody right there. So, I mean, it's just a matter of what does it say? Is there any public art? Is there any way to enhance that corner? Because that corner is a cornerstone of the city of Dunwoody. So you're, I, I did look through the PDF and I did see the, the more descriptive, the painted concrete panels, painted with Poe's gray Sherwin-Williams. I mean, you've given me kind of what I'm looking for, but I'm just not sure it's accurate or what I really want compared to some of the other. I'm gonna come back to you with some more detail on that. I, I, I think I understand it. If you don't mind, so I wanna make sure I understand the public art. I, I thought when, I forget who raised it. Uh, Rob. Right. I thought you were saying, uh, you saying down here? We're saying down there. I'm saying down there. I'm saying on Ashford Dunwoody or in the, like, I'm assuming I'm looking at a picture. Well, I guess I'm looking at the same picture on the screen as you are. And where the picnic tables are, that's Ashford Dunwoody, right? Right. And I think Rob is talking, maybe he's talking about something different. I'm talking about something there that when people, like art there, but the Dunwoody sign, some, actually, when I spoke, when this idea was presented to me, I said, and I think they thought I was half kidding, can Dunwoody be on the side of the building as you come up the interstate or come past it? You know, some acknowledgement that this is Dunwoody because people don't really know that. Um, but I don't know where Rob was thinking public art. 
I don't know that I knew where I was right. thinking either. I just think that, as everybody's right. noted, this is you know a gateway to the city. Right. So it something signature there. would be nice if right. we could figure out a way to incorporate it. And it could be right there too. I mean, it could be, we can talk about the where we have a great public art commission. We're definitely willing to partner on this. Like we can facilitate it, but it's often a condition of rezonings in communities with uh, vibrant public art. We're just a, we're just finishing our first year of public art. And so we can certainly work with y'all, but I think it can be a condition. Um, right, let me, let me, I need some conversations. I need to have some conversations on that. Okay, I don't, you know, I don't know. It doesn't have to be, you know, huge. There's all kinds of different things. Right. It could be a fountain. Right. On your, in your, whatever we called it, the courtyard. Somebody said something about a mural. Is that in keeping? It the can, if, if they're interested in that. Right. I'm, there's a lot of glass on that side. Let me, let me. Yeah. I, and it can be a metal statue. You know how to do this. Yeah. Let, let me, like, let me just talk it through and right. see what physically right. makes sense. Here right. First. It can be a metal stat. It can be a statue. It can you know, be anything. Colony be Square. the world's biggest in front of Colony Square. That's an example. They've got a bunch of stuff out there. Not really. Sorry. Yeah. But I mean, it can be. This is my understanding from the meeting, and from the materials is is that this is a supposed to be a destination shopping, thing, uh, correct? And so make it feel like a destination shopping as opposed to across the street. Got it. So. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Harris, do you have an agenda change? Yes, I would like to remove item number 11 off the consent agenda, okay. please. And it will become the, it'll, Sharon, it will go before 13. So I guess it'll become the new 12. It'll become the new 12. Yes. I okay. second that motion. Okay, uh, so there's a motion by Stacy to remove item 11 from the consent agenda and make it the new number 12 under the business items. Second by John, any further discussion? Any other amendment, uh, motion? Any other agenda changes? All right, seeing none, I call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, uh, number 11 is now number 12 under business. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Move by John, second by Stacy. Uh, Sharon, that was a motion to approve the amended consent agenda. Any discussion? Any questions? Uh, seeing none, I call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the consent agenda passes unanimously all right so the new number 12 um sharon has to read it just give me one moment right. i know you it's fine we all understand okay. mayor this is a second read of an ordinance uh, to amend the text in chapter 27 to create regulations for party houses. Madeline Smith. So the amendment under consideration is related to party houses. So um, we have defined party houses as a new use. Um, the aim is to regulate commercial events in residential homes. So by commercial event, we mean any party or ceremony or reception where a fee is charged for the use of the dwelling and or entry to the dwelling. Uh, party houses would be required to obtain a special administrative permit uh, prior to hosting an event. This is already an established process that we have for other types of um, zoning requests. So they would follow that same process. Um, we are specifically targeting commercial events. So this does not prevent uh, residents from using their homes for their own private events. Um, the intention is to prevent nuisances and maintain the residential character of neighborhoods. 
Um, party houses have presented challenges in other places like Atlanta and Sandy Springs. This ordinance is modeled after theirs. Um, party houses are not necessarily a problem in Dunwoody. We have had, I believe, one or two issues previously, um, but this is more of a preventative measure. Um, after the uh, first or during the first read at the last council meeting, um, there were some concerns brought up about what um, are the punishments for these types of violations. Um, and so uh, the violation of the zoning ordinance, because this is part of chapter 27, so violation of that uh, can result in a max, uh, maximum $1,000 fine and or up to six months in jail. Um, the main enforcers of this um, uh, regulation would likely be PD, um, since a lot of these nuisances happen in the evening when code enforcement isn't available, but code enforcement would also be involved um, in assisting PD on these types of issues. Um, at the planning commission meeting, they did recommend approval. Um, and again, since the previous meeting, there haven't been any amendments made to the ordinance. Um, we just offered some clarification again on the violation aspect. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Thank you. Anybody have questions? Surely someone has questions. So I think one of our concerns from the first read was $1,000 is nothing to these people. So I, we want our, we, we want, how do we, one, my question is, what do our neighboring jurisdictions do? Is it only $1,000 or have they up their game? And number two, why aren't we upping our game? Because like we said, $1,000 is nothing. Um, number three, I walk me through if I have a party house next door to me and I call and I decide to call 911 at 11 o'clock, walk me through that process of what happens to that party house. And am I given, you know, respite from the party house that night, or do I have to wait until they go to court? Um, so in relation to the first question um, that was discussed with our legal staff, that can be handled outside of the amendment to chapter 27 itself. Um, and then in regards to what happens, I think I might actually refer to either Richard or um, Chief. Chief of Police to address that question. Yes, Chief is here. Yeah, if code enforcement is involved, we can make the parties essentially mm -hmm. stop. But, but 11 o'clock at night, we don't have code enforcement on call. Oh, if it was a, an illegal party house uh, under this statute, we would close it down. We'd pull the plug on their music and mm -hmm. shut them down. So why, if we're going to pass this tax text, text amendment, why aren't we doing a concurrent text amendment to up the punitive damage? Why aren't we upping the punishment at the same time? So I can't answer that question, but I can say that, it, it, and maybe our attorney could weigh in if he's online, but you know, it has to do with the fact that this is a misdemeanor. And in Georgia, you can only do so much with a misdemeanor charge, uh, which is a thousand dollar fine and six months in jail, which is uh, uh, because it's an ordinance violation. So can, I'm not an attorney. right, can Bill chime in? Because I think Sandy Springs did more than that. I can, so, I certainly can, Mayor. Okay. The, uh, uh, what I would suggest to you is that the thousand dollars in the six months are the maximums, but you can also set thresholds for minimums also, council member. So I would suggest to you that perhaps that you would want to say on a first offense, that there would be a minimum of 10 days in jail uh, as, as part of the offense, because you can enhance the punishment of minimum. And, and then you perhaps put in there, but that would, could be suspendable uh, on, at the judge's discretion. So you, would, you wouldn't box yourself into some potential case that you didn't want somebody to go to jail on, but you would always have the, the that is the is the baseline of what your expectation is that the judges should do. And is that uh, something we change in this ordinance, or is that something we change in a different ordinance or in a different way? Uh, I I think you could put it in this ordinance, but uh, the, you could put a penalty provision within this ordinance. The general penalty is what we 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 wouldn't change the general penalties. Uh, for the purposes of doing an ordinance, I would put it in this ordinance. And then it, if at some point in time when it's codified by the Muni code people, they find a better place to put it, they can always set, uh, set it in a different place in our, in our codified ordinances. Go ahead, Stacey. I, I was going to okay. add one thing real quick to just 
as an FY, mm -hmm. as um, as uh, community development said, you know, we're not having a big issue with this, right? And I don't know that we'll have one moving forward. Certainly, with the adoption of the ordinance, um, I spoke to the chief in Sandy Springs today, and since they've adopted their ordinance, they've had zero cases. So, just as an That's FYI, right. okay. so what? We didn't have any problem until Sandy Springs adopted their ordinance. And then within two months, somebody bought a million and a half dollar party house. So that's the challenge. Is Sandy Springs penalties? I thought they were more severe than this. They're the same. I didn't ask you about Okay. Penalties. And I think what, Richard, I think what they're doing differently primarily is they're going after the owners of the houses now and threatening jail as opposed to the party host. Yeah, we could we could look at that. Most often, maybe not. Uh -huh. The owners are not even involved. They're right. not even there. But it, so it's, ultimately, that's how they are stopping it in Sandy Springs. Is because the owners now that are renting through Airbnb or whatever, which also is not legal in Dunwoody, right. but criminals or people with ill intentions don't care. Is that we have to hold ultimately the owner accountable. And so that's where we are. I, I'm fine with the text men as it is now okay. because we need it. Right. I also want more. Right. So I don't know whether we pass it now and give yes. direction to staff to add to it. I think we pass it now or, okay. because we don't want people coming in and buying houses. Correct. In the middle of time. Okay, John. Ellen, you brought up the uh, question that I wanted to raise, and that was the Airbnb and the short-term rental. Madeline, can you give us a quick update on what's allowed and what's not allowed? So our code uh, specifically um, states in our residential section um, where we define residential use in Chapter 27, it states that you are not allowed to rent a home for less than 30 days because uh, that's considered short-term rental, and that rules out Airbnb. Um, unless for some reason they are accommodating someone for more than 30 days. Great, thank you. And, and, we've, we've, oh, we've had issues like this in the past where a house might have a pool and therefore it's more of a rental or a party function than that. Now, uh, Richard, if our residents see Airbnb rentals advertised online, does code enforcement able to take any proactive aspect based on the advertising of a home for less than you? Yes, we have. We have. In fact, there was one uh, today I was familiar with where we went out to the lady in court and we checked it. She went back and started advertising again for short term. So we got her again. Okay. So that if code enforcement is enforcing the short term rentals on public sites, that's also some aspect of the same sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm good with passing this. If we need to tighten it up, maybe we should have. Um, look at all of our penalties to make sure they're adequate and haven't need to be raised, lowered, or just reviewed. So maybe it's an overall check to a certain extent too. Thank so you. That's it. Thank you. I appreciate the input. Anybody else? Okay. This is some business item. Move to approve. Second. Uh, Sharon, that was moved by Stacy. Second by Joe. Any further discussion? Seeing I would that just like to yes. have it move forward and, and, and have that review and doing a minimum and like, right. Let's make sure that our penalties match Sandy Springs, because I don't think it was a coincidence this happened two months after they went public with their new rules. All right. Calling the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, Sharon, that passes unanimously. Oh, next is me. Every two years, we elect a mayor pro tem um, who serves... In, uh, in case I cannot, or I, yeah. So, um, uh, Madam Mayor, if I so may, uh, I propose the nomination of the senior and most honorable representative of District 3 at large, Mr. John Hennigan, as Mayor Pro Tem. Okay. Second. Uh, Sharon, that was a motion, uh, Mayor Pro Tem for John Hennigan, a second by Councilwoman Harris. Any discussion, questions, comments? No, we have a, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Right. Uh, Sharon, that's unanimous. <laughs> Which one was that? Right, aye. right. 
you can you can vote against yourself you're still right you could vote against yourself and you would still win um all right i think sharon you have to read the next thingamajigga yes thank you john for serving <laughs> Right, just for one moment. Okay, Mayor, the next, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. The next item is an emergency ordinance of the Mayor and Council of the City of Dunwoody, Georgia, under Section 1.03 of the Charter of the City of Dunwoody, Georgia, declaring local emergency of the novel coronavirus disease 2021-2022. Omicron variant, global pandemic, and for other purposes. Bill, do you have anything you want to say? This is just simply. as very briefly. This is simply for the purpose of Zoom meetings. If if it occurs, you don't have to call Zoom meetings, but we wanted to go ahead and have this emergency ordinance in place if things got worse. Uh, so that's that's why we did it. But it it, the, it has no other limitations on any activity that the council or the boards or commissions might want to do. Right, and we have members of boards and commissions who are already expressing concerns about in-person meetings, and we particularly want to be able to accommodate those and have quorums and everything, and this is what we need to do. So any other questions or discussions? Quick question, so does this mean that for public comment for our meetings, it's allowable on Zoom again? It would be. Yes, it would be. Go ahead, Joe. So, and then from us perspective, uh, do we still need the quorum present? No, and on a call this morning with GMA, their opinion is, is that you don't even have to use this ordinance. If people wanna be hybrid because of COVID or COVID concerns, you can use that as a medical reason. And in Georgia, you have unlimited medical reasons to be virtual per the meeting I had this morning. Per individual, right, right. So any other questions? Seeing none, I think we had a, have we moved to approve? No, I, I need a motion, please. <laughs> I move to approve. Second. Uh, Sharon, that was Rob Price moving to approve and Catherine seconding. Um, any further discussions or questions? Hearing none, I call the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion. Thank you. No, I was, oh, no, you can go. <laughs> just, I was waiting. No, oh, Sharon she, doesn't have to read it. Yeah, she doesn't have to read it. She doesn't have to read it because it's not a resolution or an ordinance change. Uh, Mayor and Council, this is a cleanup amendment for the CARES 2 fund. And for the new council members, at some point, I'd like to sit down with both of you and discuss how this was set up. Uh, but for those that don't know, the ARP final rules have come out. And so in the next month or so, we will start talking about that. But in the meantime, I wanted to do some administrative housekeeping on the CARES money. And I'll go through them pretty quickly, but it's just pretty uh, self-explanatory. We're clearing out the hazard pay to match exactly what was paid out. The amount for not-for-profit grants, just for the record, the city put out $635,000 to eight different not-for-profits over the past year and a half. So I consider that a, a, a great deal there. In this particular instance, we're decreasing city supplies and services down to what will probably be about $80,000 remaining and the contingency to $400,000. We're in the CARES 2 money, going to budget the Brook Run lighting at an estimated 800,000. And we still do not have a good figure on that, but we are unsure if we can do that with art. So we're gonna start the ball rolling with it here. So I wanted to kind of pocket that for now. The city supplies and services, we could decrease because almost everything we would do with that would be eligible under ARP. The things like vaccination events and stuff like that can still. So we, we don't need as much there. This is to get us through the next couple of months. Uh, to also give you just for the record, we straightened out one, we had a one small business grant that wasn't totaled up in the dollar figures earlier. So that's reconciled. And the city gave out $1.8 million worth of grants to small businesses in Dunwoody over the past year and a half. So when people ask, where did this money go? 
you can point to that and the not-for-profits as the biggest bang for the buck during the, the amount that we had for CARES. Uh, still leaving money in Alfresco grants and entrepreneurial support. Uh, the tourism reopening is there. And then also in here is 225,000. We've added a full-time staff member to handle accounting that we're going to start doing with all this federal funding. Technically, since we're paying for it out of CARES too, I can treat it like general fund money instead of having to do certain things with payroll. So we are just cleaning it up that way. And that'll be all for, I think it's two years worth of that person. If there's any questions, I'll take them at this time. Tom. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jay. Uh, just a quick question. Um, I think putting the Brook Run lights in here is a great idea because there's substantial savings, as we talked about when, uh, when Brent presented this, uh, going with the higher upfront cost over the long term. My, my, my question is this, based on the number you have in there, 800,000, does that mean we're going to move forward with both phase two and phase three? It is a ballpark for that. In our discussions with Georgia Power, we unfortunately got a higher price when they came back to us. And we're like, that's not how this works. So yeah. we're having to go back and forth with them on straightening it out. So we just want to put something where we knew we could cover it. But the idea would be to do both phases at the same time. Correct. That's the great. savings is tremendous. Over the, over Absolutely. The I agree with that. Thank you. Joe. And Jay, um, I love that we have all the transparency on our website, the Nobody Cares Act website. So I'm assuming we're going to update these numbers on that publicly facing. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah. And then that's more of a comment than a question. I guess maybe back to Michael starting the El Fresco grants. We, I, we still have 124K open in that. Yeah. You so, talk um, to restaurants. yeah, we need to kind of walk around and let our friends know that they can still apply for that if they want some space heaters and all those good things. But yeah, thank you, Jay. Yeah. John. Jay, can you give us an update on the uh, entrepreneur support? Tell us, we really haven't done anything there. Can you tell us where we are, who can apply? How do we help not there yet. do that? I can tell you, we're, we're working with this economic advisory committee and we're not there yet. Okay. So we um, had a meeting with our consultants, um, with members of the task force, and we are honing in on categories. Um, and I was actually, in, I'll, was in visiting one of our corporate citizens and they have some unused space and I asked if maybe we could have it for this. They did not say no. So we'll see, I'm not counting on anything, but it was just an opportunity. And so, but we are, I think we have a meeting at the end of the month. And so the 20th, yes, the 28th. So we're working towards coming up with a robust plan that makes sense. And, and then also, does it look differently for mom and pop type restaurants or businesses or small businesses versus technology company startups. So that's where we are. Well, I'm happy to hear the ball is rolling as long as we're doing something. Cause thank you. Yeah, and we're doing as something. As far as uh, empty space, uh, Carvana's wonderful news. I, yes. I, I, it's it's big tax benefit there too. So. Um, it's wonderful news. Yep, wonderful news. Thank you. So go ahead. Stay Move soon. to approve. Second. Moved by Stacy, second by Tom. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimously, Sharon. Thank you very much. I guess I'm supposed to acknowledge that you're up there, Chief. Thank you. Mayor and Council, the item before you is the approval of a Criminal Justice Coordinating Council grant award. We were notified in December that we had received a $38,935 grant. This is in the category of use of force and de-escalation equipment for our department. It's uh, reimbursable, so we pay it out. They uh, provide it for us, uh, the funds for us, and there's no match from the city. And this just authorizes the mayor to sign the appropriate documents. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Move to approve. Wait, I have a question. Oh, you can do it, wait, we have a motion, so we can do it. Move by John. Second. Second by Joe. Any further questions or discussion? Um, where is this going to live and how does it work? Like, well, 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 it's a simulator, so I, I'm assuming it's a piece of. No, a, it, no, it's it's e, not the simulator. We already have the simulator. It's equipment related to the simulator, so that, like some additional uh, handguns and different things that work with the simulator. Got it. Okay. So it's equipment for the and it's over at the annex. As over at the annex, and just out of curiosity, how often do our officers do this training? Because obviously, I mean. It's so important and yeah, a fair, valuable part of fair, fairly often, probably at least once a month, uh, they go while they're on shift, particularly sometimes on weekends and nights. It's a little bit easier after things slow down or, you know, three o'clock in the morning or something. And so they do that training quite frequently. 
Sorry. And do any of our surrounding jurisdictions have this as well? Or sure. okay, they all do. Okay. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other comment or question, I call the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing aye. none. Aye. It passes unanimously. Sharon, that was unanimous. And it was John made the motion and Joe seconded in case you didn't hear. Thank you, Chief. And thank you all for applying for it. Um, any public comments? Hello, sir. If you could just state your name. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. My name is Daniel Vickers. Is it on the microphone? Is it on? It is. Okay, there was better. That was better, sir. Uh, I forwarded a letter to you all, and I thank you for acknowledging the receipt. That letter, I'm going to read some portions of that letter to you tonight. Uh, let me get straight to the point. The developers of the cottages of Dunwoody, Peachland, uh, Limited Liability, and the Miller Group. LLC have deceived the Dunwoody City Council and the neighborhoods that surround the development of Robert Stroud. November 24th, last year, the mature trees uh, that surround the development were removed. Uh, since July 2020, the City Council uh, publicly tasked the development group lead, Robert Miller, to work with surrounding neighborhoods, that's Dunwoody Walk, Dunwoody Knoll, and Fairfield, to hear and address concerns before variances and rezoning requests would be voted upon. Bless you. Somebody, hold on one second, sir. Let's see if we can get this to work. Okay, try, go ahead, sorry. Sure. Uh, these concerns were documented for months before and after meetings, Zoom calls, uh, zoning board and city council presentations. Our concerns were shared in documentation provided to the developers and in meetings with Richard McLeod, John Olson, members of the zoning commission, board of management, city council and mayor. Uh, Dunwoody Walk's primary concern was preservation of the tree buffer which was also among the concerns of Dunwoody Knoll and Fairfield. A unanimous petition to save the trees from Dunwoody Walks, homeowners, associate, homeowners uh, were shared uh, by our serving president at the time, uh, Judy Wakes. Uh, she attended a public meeting uh, with others from the surrounding neighborhood, neighborhoods where they shared their concerns. Uh, the city, uh, ultimately approved the rezoning uh, request of Mr. Miller and Peachland, uh, but they imposed 26 conditions on the, the developer that were to be met as a condition of approval of the rezoning request. I want to point your attention to condition 23. I think the meeting itself where this was introduced was October 26, uh, 2020. Uh, condition 23 refers to the buffer agreements that were to be worked out between the surrounding neighborhoods. If there was any deviations from the known plan, Robert Miller, Miller Group, or someone from Peachland was to confer with the surrounding neighborhoods. Thus, we were shocked uh, to see the swift removal of the tree canopy and buffer. And this was all done on the day before Thanksgiving last year. Uh, we were even more surprised to learn in speaking with Robert Miller, I spoke to him myself, uh, that there was no intention of preserving the trees. In Thank fact, you very much, sir. Can you, we, ha we have your letter. If you want to finish up, we'll give you a little bit of extra time if you, have, uh, if you want to conclude your thoughts. Well, one thing, uh, we have uh, questions with the city on who approved. He, Mr. Miller pointed out that he revised his landscaping plan. Uh, we would like to uh, know how that process worked with, with, um, by the city or the planning commission. Um, we also want to uh, let you all know that if his group, the Miller group or Peachland, 
uh, ever uh, come before city council again uh, for approval of variances or uh, development for the city. We would like to be invited. To the city. Um, we don't want to speak in opposition. It might be something that benefits the city, but we, if there is opposition, we just want others to know what kind of person we do. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Uh, Eric, do you have any comments? Uh, no further comments, Mayor. We do not need an executive session tonight. That's a good thing. Um, any council comments? John. Madam Mayor, I believe there's a policy document that uh, the city council reviews and goes over every couple of years, basically on how we run our meeting. Uh -huh. If uh, we could have that reviewed at a future council meeting, just to make sure that new council members actually know that that document exists and that the current ones are re, re, re aware of it. Certainly. Thank you. Go ahead, Joe. Um, yeah, so um, welcome. And of course, I'm not the newbie anymore, but yet, <laughs> haha, but it's all good. So think about it in just two years, four new folks are up here now. And so I'm still learning a lot every day I'm out here as well and um, trying to make sure Lynn doesn't get burnt out and takes vacation all the time, right? Um, I remember two years ago, right before the pandemic, we had a retreat and, and Craig Lesser was the facilitator and he went around and asked us eight years from now, write down what you wanna see, eight years from now. Now it's, now how many years is it now? It's six, right? So, right, we, 2020, a speech in the choir, obviously things had a little hiccup here, but um, you know, in the software business that I work in, there's a, the X axis, I had to look this up, the horizontal and the Y, there's a, you can put competitors if you sell a product or something in a quadrant, ability to execute and completely, completeness of vision. So you say, we've got great plans, we have great vision, but are we executing, right? So I've always gone back to, it's the execution phase, right? So we sat back in 2020, we had this, we reset and reconfirmed our vision and plans and yeah, and then we had the pandemic hit. So um, all I'm saying is I'm looking forward to working with everybody. I'm looking forward to our retreat. I'm looking forward to focusing on, you know, the future and um, getting things done. Watch what we're gonna do in 2022. So thank you and go dogs. Um, I just wanna thank um, that our dummy police chief and the other uh, chiefs of police who came here today to publicly announced their frustration with the Cab County school systems and the lack of movement on us allowing to play, play some speed camera detectors in on our public streets to protect our school children. And I want to publicly say I'm extremely disappointed at Cab County schools that it came to this. I was here today and I was proud, again, proud of our police chief and, and thankful that the other police chiefs arrived and um, I hope they wake up and sign, sign the agreement. Catherine. Um, I'll just second everything Stacy just said. Thank you, Chief, uh, and the other police department. It's it's just absolutely ridiculous. And I implore the, the Cape County school system to wake up and protect our kids. It's ridiculous that they're they're been dragging their feet on this. But I appreciate the effort of our our police chief and our police department in going the extra mile to try and get this through. And uh, Catherine and Rob, welcome. Look forward to. Sit next to you for the next few years and working with you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll ditto what uh, Stacy and Tom said. And I appreciate Chief and the other Chiefs working together and caution the media to fact check any response to CAB Schools has. Um, so far, the two things I've heard they said could not be. Well, they, they are very inaccurate. So um, this system is free to the city, so any city and unincorporated cab can pursue it. And um, it is not a cash grab. And it only looks at license plates. So with that, um, I need a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Move by Stacy. Second. Second by Joe, go dogs. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you all. Eight. Yeah, I'm really bang it at the end. <laughs>
and IT can turn off things. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Um, um, I can laugh. My dad has to do it. Try to call me out. I'm going The next month or two, you can virtually participate. I know. So that without. works for February. That's right. good. And then one's work, and then one. So these are all we'll planned before that. I get elected. Yeah, that's fine. And you, can, you can't do a year under state law. Well, to to check to go in virtual, right? To go in virtual from two to six. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think I have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 